promoting health and longevity through diet, metabolic and molecular mechanisms, an update. Okay, let me start with a very short introduction. As you probably know, um, life expectancy has more than doubled in the last 150 years. That's a fantastic achievement of modern medicine and public health. But as a consequence of this huge increase in lifespan, in, in average lifespan, the proportion of, for example, Americans older than 65 went from 4% in 1900, as you can see here, to 13% in 2010, predicted 21%. In Australia, it was 5% in 26, 1926, it, is, it was 15% in 2016, predicted 25%. In countries like Italy, Sweden, Japan, the situation is even worse. Look, these are data from Italy. We are already at 20.6% older than 65, predicted 38% uh, uh, in two, 2030, and 34.4% in 2050. So one third of the Italian population is gonna be older than 65. The problem is that these people, they are not healthy. As you can see here, these are data that, you know, we just published in Aging Cell. These are the results of a study conducted with Vincenzo Tella, who is a professor of health economics at Rome Tobergata. We had access to a data set of 900 GPs, Italian GPs, that who have entered electronically the data for more than 1 million patients. And as you can see here, in people older than 65, at least 90% they have one chronic disease and 65% they have two or more chronic diseases. So these people are getting older, but they're not getting healthier. And that's a major problem for the sustainability of all the advanced economies, healthcare systems. In US, in Italy, in Australia, in many other developed countries, we know that <clears throat> the current approach that is to treat disease once they already developed is unsustainable. And on top of this uh, epidemic of unhealthy aging, there is another problem that is the epidemic of obesity that has reached uh, proportions that are impossible. So basically in US, 70% of the population is either obese or overweight. In Australia is similar data. In Italy, as you can see here, you know, we are around again, you know, probably between obese and overweight is around uh, 50 to 60 percent. The problem is that in, in all these countries and in all the other developed countries, forget about, you know, what's going on, for example, in, in the Middle East, where the proportion of obese kids is exploding. But, you know, in U.S., approximately 20 percent, in Italy, between uh, 30 and for males and 23 for girls are overweight or obese. So this is a, a serious problem because the sooner they develop obesity and the metabolic alterations, think about that type two diabetes is strongly associated with, with obesity, the sooner they're gonna develop the complications. So for example, was when I, just to give an example of how tragic it is, you know, when I was a medical student, type two diabetes was called also adult onset type two diabetes. But now it's not anymore adult onset. And the problem is, just to give an example, you know, type 2 diabetes is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for kidney nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy, uh, and many other complications, including dementia. But let's talk about nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy. After 20 years of type 2 diabetes, 40% of people develop kidney 
the beta kidney nephropathy. And eventually they, they're, they're gonna need dialysis or kidney transplantation. So if you start to be diabetic when you are 60, then you know by 80, you know, you have 40%, but you know, that's a different story. Like if you start to become diabetic when you are 20, but, by, but when you are 40, 40% 40 of the population that are four years old, they have kidney nephropathy. So this is a major, major issue is that I think our governments, our officers, our politicians are underestimating. So again, so these are the problems. So we are facing among you know, other problems like global warming and uh, environmental pollution uh, that as I will explain in other lecture, have lots to do with what we do, what we eat, how we behave. But w this is, is gonna be another, another uh, the topic of another, another uh, lecture. But anyway, so we have a, a, a aging of the population. These people are not healthy, they are, they're unhealthy. So there is an expansion of morbidity, of multi-drug consumption with all the interactive side effects of these drugs. And, um, and so there are people who are living longer and in poor health. There is the um, uh, overlapping epidemic of uh, abdominal obesity and, and all the unhealthy uh, adaptations, complications of uh, this epidemic of obesity, and therefore the sustainability of the healthcare system is, is impossible unless we change strategy. So in 2014, uh, I wrote, you know, this, 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 this uh, a, 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 um, editorial for Nature and what, you know, with uh, Brian Kennedy and Walter Longo, what we proposed here is that uh, the current approach, the current, the current medical approach to disease is a disease center approach. So basically, you know, what we are doing right now is to develop drugs that are treating diseases that typically they take between 20 and 40 years to develop. And we treat, we treat them once at a time. So now, you know, we wait people to develop clinical cancer, clinic coronary, coronary artery, uh, um, cardiovascular disease, uh, clinical stroke, and then, you know, we are trying to treat this disease with drugs. But in reality, we are not treating them. We are just keeping them under control. You know, there is a, we are slowing the progression of the disease, we are, we are not treating the disease. We think that the, the, the optimal approach, or at least this approach should be combined with the disease center approach is the prevention center approach that shouldn't be based on the classical epidemiological data where you know so you know you exercise more eat more fruits and vegetables less meat uh, you know all these obvious but unsophisticated unmechanistic uh, approach we now have discovered which are the pathways the metabolic and molecular pathways that are controlling aging and accumulation of mo molecular damage leading to multiple disease so our idea is that, you know, with this intervention that are, from my point of view, are primarily lifestyle intervention, we block upstream the accumulation of molecular damage. We are preventing multiple disease downstream. With one, with, 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 with one intervention, we are basically blocking downstream multiple diseases, so sort of treating them when they're already developed. Okay, so which are these metabolic and molecular mechanisms Mm, that are controlling aging and healthy longevity. So this is a complicated slide, but you know, let me summarize for you, you know, what, 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 is, what, what, what we are talking about. So these are all the rodent animal models of longevity. So these mice are living significantly longer than the control mice. And as you can see here, there are dietary interventions, and we're gonna talk about these in this lecture. And then there are genetic, where we knock out down a gene or we overexpress one gene along some pathways, and these animals are living longer and healthier. And then we have drugs like rapamycin that is an inhibitor of mTOR. mTOR 
is part of this insulin IGF-1 and TOR pathway is one of the most important nutrient sensing pathways. So basically our cells, every cell of our organism has a sensor. It's like, you know, for the, for the fuel, as a sense of how much energy and proteins are available for growth. And when the body, the cells are perceiving that there is less energy and proteins, and so there is less insulin IGF-1 and amino acids, there is a down-regulation of these pathways. And whenever we down-regulate these pathways with diet, genetics, or drugs, the animals are living longer. And this association between uh, down-regulation of the nutrient-sensing pathways, in particular the insulin IGF-1 and TOR pathway, and longevity is well conserved from these worms who fly to mouth. I'm going to probably tell you in another, another lecture why, why we think that that's the case, why it works. But, you know, we have solid, very solid data to say that, you know, that's true and that, you know, we can modulate aging and lifespan and health span by working on, for example, these pathways. Now, let's go into my field of expertise in particular, that is dietary restriction. So, uh, in multiple animals, we have demonstrated that, you know, if we reduce by 20, 30, 40 percent uh, food intake, that without malnutrition, with all the vitamins and minerals, animals are living much longer. For mice, for example, for, the, for many strains of mice, if you reduce by up to 50 percent caloric intake without malnutrition, these mice, they're living up to 50% longer. It's like if a human being, instead of living 80 years, would live 120 years. Not only these animals are living longer, but they are much healthier. And that's what is important because nobody wants to live a long life and spend the last 30 years demented or, you know, in a bed because he has a stroke or, you know, with multiple cancer, coronary uh, the cardiovascular disease and many other problems. So what we know is that in these animals, these animals are living longer and many of the chronic age associated disease from cancer, kidney disease, cardiac disease, autoimmune disease, new generations are either prevented or delayed by many years. Months in mice is equivalent to two years in humans. And what is super interesting is that about 30% of CR mice and 50% of growth hormone receptor deficient mice, they die when they are very old without any patholo gross pathological lesions. Lesion, meaning that in mammals, it's possible to live a long life without developing disease, without suffering, without taking drugs. So that's the good news. It is biologically possible and that's what we are studying how how it comes and how we can obtain in as many people as possible these outcome that i think everybody wants you know long life without developing disease now i don't have time to go into the mice data let's talk about the 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 the, the, the non-human primates so monkeys data there are two studies still ongoing, there is the Wisconsin study that is, uh, has been ongoing for 20 years. The, the, the rhesus monkeys have been randomized to 30% CR without malnutrition or ad libitum diet. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, the, the data published in 2014 in Nature Communication show that the, the, the CR animals, the CR monkeys, they live significantly longer and they have less, threefold less chronic disease, in particular type 2 diabetes and glucose intolerance is completely prevented. There is a 50% reduction in cancer and a 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease. There is less brain atrophy in several areas of the brain. There is less uh, sarcopenia and less auditory loss and less frailty. So it's not true that color restriction is leading to frailty. It's ad libitum feeding that is leading to frailty and sarcopenia. 
Then there is the other study, is the NIA study, the CR, monkey NIA study, and even, you know, the, the story is a bit complicated, but, you know, the, the paper that, you know, they just published in Nature Communication 2017 uh, shows that even in these monkeys, there is an extension in lifespan, and uh, approximately one-third of the CR monkeys in the NIA study, they have been living more than 40 years. 40 years for a monkey is like 120 years for human beings. Uh, in fact, you know, the average lifespan in, in, in monkeys is around 26, 27 years. And there is one uh, old onset CR male monkey that, uh, that is currently living is 43 years old. It's like 130 years for human beings. So it looks like it works even in in, 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 in monkeys, and that is, is possible to live a long life, to extend human lifespan, but most importantly, health span. Now, let's move quickly into humans. So, I'm not going to spend time talking about obesity. Obesity is a major disease and is associated with the great majority of, these, of, 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 of chronic disease that we see in our hospital, in our clinics, in some way are linked with excessive adiposity, with overweight and obesity, from type 2 diabetes, to hypertension, to uh, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, to cancer, colon, breast, uh, uterine, kidney, esophageal, pancreas, liver, uh, with uh, fatty liver disease, with gallbladder disease, with stroke, with uh, pulmonary disease, uh, so with many disease. And we know that, you know, if people, they are losing weight, you know, we have studies with uh, calorie restriction, but most importantly with uh, uh, gastric bypass surgeries, and, uh, and uh, bariatric surgery, and we see basically that these people, they have 50% less cardiovascular disease and cancer, for example. These are New England Journal of Medicine papers. And uh, just to give you, this is another, another example. So basically here, you know, with, uh, this is a, a paper we published with uh, Giuseppe Remuzzi and Pierre Ruggenenti on diabetes. We enrolled, uh, patients with abdominal obesity, type 2 diabetes, and uh, initial kidney nephropathy. And we randomized to 25% uh, CR or control standard diet for six months. The results of this study is that, you know, the people on color restriction, they lost weight, the they, they, they waist circumference was, was decreased. There was a significant reduction in blood glucose, glycated hemoglobin. There was a significant improvement in uh, glucose disposal rate measured with the clamp. There was a significant reduction in systolic, diastolic, angiotensin 2, and a significant reduction in C-reactive protein and urinary albuminuria. You know, we, one intervention, Basically, we have been treating all the cardiometabolic risk factors without taking drugs that have side effects. And most importantly, for the first time, we have shown that, you know, people that are, these people with initial nephropathy that typically have, are, have, have um, glomerular hyperfiltration and glomerular hyperfiltration is the first phase of kidney nephropathy. And so the, at the beginning, the kidney is hyperfiltrating the, 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 and this is a, a bad prognostic factor for the progression into full-blown uh, 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 chronic nephropathy. And so here we show for the first time with the Yoxol method, that is the gold standard to measure glomerular filtration rate, that, you know, color restriction, moderate color restriction is able to significantly improve glomerular filtration rate. Okay? However, in contrast with all this data showing that, you know, in overweight obese people, uh, 
uh, being leaner calorie restriction or being leaner having a lower BMI is improving is reducing the risk of developing multiple chronic disease epidemiological data and that's a major point epidemiological data we're going to discuss about it are just association data there are many confounding factors and so we have to be very very careful when we uh, look and we try to interpret the results of epidemiological data epidemiological data they are only suggesting in fact in this famous paper by Fliegel in JAMA 2013 that is by the way replicating in, in other uh, cohorts around the world the data are showing that people who are overweight that have a body mass index between 25 and 30 they have a lower mortality than people that are normal weight that is contrary to what you know all the international society and guidelines are recommending you know people should have a normal body weight but we're going to talk about i mean normal body weight doesn't mean anything Okay, because you know you can have a BMI of 23 and have a lot of body fat, a lot, a lot of visceral fat, and 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 you have you have the same metabolic complication as someone who is obese. But anyway, uh, so when this published, when this paper was published, you know, uh, all the major newspaper in U.S. and around the world, you know, look the New York Times study suggests lower mortality risk for people deemed to be overweight. Extra weight said won't raise death risk, Washington Post. Time magazine, being overweight is linked to lower risk of mortality. So everybody was excited, can you imagine? So basically the message was don't lose weight. You know, being overweight, it's safer than being normal weight. So keep doing whatever you want. So I was in Harvard giving a talk at that time. And you know, with Frank who we said, no, look, you know, we have to do something. I mean, this is completely wrong. I mean, this is just, a bad design study with you know not the proper control so what we did and we published this data in the british medical journal we stratified people these are the the, the database of the harper database of the health professional study studies we stratified people by bmi as you can see here in blue people with the bmi between 18.5 and 22.5 in green 22.5 25 in yellow 25 to 30 so overweight and in red obese individuals but not only with stratified by bmi but also by four healthy lifestyle factors with zero are people that do not exercise they eat unhealthy diets, they smoke, and they overdrink alcohol. And three and four are people who are exercising half an hour a day, five times a week. They are eating healthier diet, so let's refine carbohydrates, less meat, more whole grains, vegetables, beans, and fruits. And uh, they are not smoking and they are not they are drinking only two drinks per day per, per males and one for females and so what you can see here clearly that yes in the unhealthy people is true there is the this u-shaped relationship and the leaner people they have the same mortality than overweight than obese people and much higher than overweight but in the people who are healthy they have healthy lifestyle factors there is a linear relationship and the people that have the lowest mortality are the people with the bmi between 18.5 and 22.5 and these mortality is 60 percent lower than the control group the reference group and you know what the problem is that you know even these people are educated people because they are health professionals do you know how many people they have a BMI less than 25 because they are exercising, eating healthy air diets and not smoking and not over drinking. 20% of males and 9% of females. All the rest are lean for other reasons that have nothing to do with 
these healthy lifestyle factors and that's why you know we see a higher mortality so these people probably they have some uh, yet undetectable disease that are accelerated aging and they are losing weight and voluntary weight loss so as you can see you know we have to be very careful when we interpret the epidemiological data that are just associative data now let's look at some randomized clinical trial data so some good solid data because these are randomized clinical trials so we can infer a cause effect relationship so in this study this is this is the calorie uh, randomized clinical trial is a multi-center study there were four centers washington university the pi was my mentor, John Hollis, I was a co-investigator. Then there is Tufts, Pennington, and Duke University. In this study, we randomized uh, 220 people for two years to 25% calorie restriction or control at libitum fed with a two to one ratio. The uh, volunteers, they were 20 to 50 years old. BMI between 22 and 28, so over, slightly overweight, upper limit of normal weight for BMI, relatively healthy, they didn't have diseases and sedentary. So over these, in the first year, they lost approximately eight kilos and they meant, on average, they maintain this uh, weight loss for the remaining uh, 12 months. In, uh, at the end of the study, they lost 10% body weight, 10.4% body weight, and 26% reduction in trunk fat measured by DEXA. There are some data that have not been published yet, so I'm going to just present what has been published. Uh, there is a significant reduction in cholesterol. Remember, these people, they were young, healthy, non-obese individuals, and yet we had a significant reduction in total cholesterol a significant reduction in triglyceride, a significant increase in HDL cholesterol, a significant improvement in HOMA insulin resistant index, significant reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. We had a significant reduction in uh, uh, F2 isoprostate, there are biomarkers of oxidative stress, so less oxidative stress. And uh, we had a significant reduction in C-reactive protein, TNF-alpha, and uh, white blood cells, so much less inflammation. And uh, what is interesting, that in this study, for the first time, we looked not only at the inflammation, but also at the cell-mediated immunity. So basically, we vaccinated these people with the vaccine for hepatitis A, tetanus, diphtheria, and pneumonia. And what we have shown and published in this paper in aging, in aging 2016 is that, you know, there is no impairment of the cell mediated immunity. So we have a reduction in inflammation without impairment in immunity. That's very important because a lot of people, they are concerned that calorie restriction may cause immune dysfunction. That's not true at least, you know, this degree of color restriction. Then, you know, we measure num a number of other hormones and factors that are typically changed in mice with color restriction, and we saw basically similar results, significant reduction in leptin, in T3, in, and a significant increase in, in IGF binding protein 1, no change in IGF 1, or in, in IGF PP3. Now, in this study, there is a randomized clinical trial, so it's super powerful. We have many other data, but we haven't published yet. The people, they went from a mean BMI of 25 to a mean BMI of 22.5. So there is still space for more benefits. And as you can see here, this is a longitudinal cross-sectional study of the volunteers of the mainly, not, not all of them, but, you know, a great proportion of these people have been studying for years are members of the Color Restriction Society. So these people, they are firmly convinced that color restriction without malnutrition, with optimal nutrition, with all, with 100% of the RDI for each nutrient is working also in humans and it's going to extend their 
lifespan and health span. So, for example, uh, just to give an example of these people, this, this guy is a good friend, uh, went from a body weight of 82 kilos, 180 pounds to 61, 134. BMI went from 26 to 19.4, and now it's weight stable. There's no anorexia here. It's weight stable for years, around these 61 kilos. The total cholesterol went from 244 to 165, LDL from 176 to 97, fasting glucose from 87 to 74, blood pressure 145, 85 to 95 over 60. So to make a long story short, we have published many, many papers uh, on this group of people practicing calorie restriction without malnutrition. These people, they are very lean, 12% body weight. They have, all of them, they have very low triglyceride, 50 milligram deciliter on average. They have a total cholesterol HDL ratio of 2.4, so very low cholesterol and very high HDL cholesterol. Everybody, all the people, this is a biomarkers of calorie restriction in humans. They have a blood pressure of around 110 over 70. So this is the blood pressure of a teenager, very low fasting glucose in the 85 range, very low fasting insulin, 1.5 micro units per ml, very low inflammation with C-reactive protein of 0.2 milligram deciliter, meaning no inflammation, lower TNF alpha, interleukin 6, and we measure the interior media thickness of the common carotid arteries. They have clean arteries, they don't have atherosclerotic plaques, they have improved left ventricular diastolic function, so their, their heart is more elastic and efficient, so there is less fibrosis, uh, there is less, there is an improvement in heart rate variability, there is a biomarker of cardiac uh, uh, autonomic nervous system health, and uh, so to make a long story short, what we have been shown both in calorie phase two and with the cronies uh, is that basically uh, cardiovascular disease in are almost completely preventable by lifestyles by healthy diet by calorie restriction without malnutrition and just to tell you how important are these data because you know 40 percent of people in western countries they are dying of cardiovascular this is the number one cause of death and coronary artery disease and all the atherosclerotic from you know uh, ischemic stroke heart failure most of heart failures you know periphery artery disease and many other ones they have to do with atherosclerosis and hypertension and as I show you, basically, these people they have a fantastic cardiometabolic profile. It's much better than these one. These are the results of the Framingham Heart Study published in Circulation 2006. As you can see here, they measured in men and women when they were 50 years old, uh, the risk factors. And what they found is that the people that when they were 50, they had a total cholesterol lower than 180. A untreated blood pressure lower than 120 over 80. They were not smoking, not diabetic, and had a BMI less than 25. They had a risk, a lifetime risk of developing myocardial infarction that was only 5%. People who had one abnormal, one of these was abnormal, had a risk of 50%, from 5% to 50%, 10 times higher. And people who had two or more abnormal risk factor had a 69% risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So we went from 5% to 70%. And the median survival after 50 was more than 39 years, between 32, so 82 to 95, more than 95, in the people with optimal risk factors and 11 years shorter, 28 years for people with two or more cardiometabolic risk factors. So when people, they tell me, look, you know, 
who cares? You know, life is life. Is, you know, you live only once. You have to enjoy. Uh, and, you know, and then you know, at the end, you know, who wants to live for a year longer? No, no, no. It's not one year longer. Forget about the the disease, the pain and suffering. But here we are talking about on average eleven years of shorter lifespan. And then we're going to also talk probably in the next lectures about the sustainability, the financial sustainability of this approach and the environmental sustainability of this approach. Because you know what we eat, the high consumption of animal products has a huge effect. 25% of the CO2 of the global warming is due to intensive animal farming and pollution and other stuff are linked with intensive on with intensive animal farming and all the intensive agriculture to create the to, to, to produce the crops to feed these animals but you know we'll talk about it later so it's not only you you know i choose you know what people are doing in western society they have a huge impact on the planetary health now in these people that are practicing kind of moderate severe calorie restriction without malnutrition, we also measure a number of hormones that are typically changed in long-lived calorie restricted animals. And what we see is that the great majority of hormone adaptations that are typical of CR mice are also happening in humans. Meaning humans, they adapt to calorie restriction as uh, animals, as rodents who are living longer do. So they have a significant reduction in insulin. We're going to talk about you know, these, many of these factors that are implicated in the pathogenesis of cancer, dementia. So they have reduced insulin, reduced leptin, increased adiponectin, reduced T3, reduced carbohydrate temperature. Carbohydrate temperature is a very good marker of longevity. In the Baltimore longitudinal studies, people that are, have a lower core body temperature are living significantly longer, reduced testosterone, estrogens, they have increased cortisol, even if, if it's not pathological, but there is significant increased cortisol, reduced inflammation, reduced oxidative stress, but no change in IGF-1 and IGF, IGF-1 PP3 unless protein intake is also reduced, but we're gonna talk about it later about this one. It's probably another lecture. In these people, in these volunteers, we were also able to, to collect skeletal muscle biopsies to, and colon mucosal biopsies you know, to, to, to study the molecular, cellular molecular adaptations. So these are skeletal muscle biopsies. You know, we did uh, Illumina microarray on, uh, 12 uh, calorie restricted individuals in blue, 12 age and sex matched controls, sedentary controls, eating a typical American diet, and in green are sedentary individuals eating a typical American diet that are 25 years younger. So what we have shown is that in humans, in the skeletal muscle, at least, there is a downregulation of the insulin hydrophone pathway. Do you remember when I told you that they, they, this nutrient sensing, the downregulation of this nutrient sensing pathway of this insulin hydrophone pathway is key in many animal models of longevity to in, improve longevity, health, increase the health, the health span and lifespan. Here we see that basically in humans, there is a downregulation of the insulin hydrophone pathway. It makes sense. They have lower insulin, they have lower. Uh, bioavailable IGF-1. And so what you can see here, there is a downregulation of the PI3 AKT pathway. And when there is a downregulation of AKT, there is an upregulation of FOX. This is a very important concept. Let me explain you what does it mean. So when you have an increase in FOXO because there is a downregulation of the insulin IGF-1 pathway, FOXO translocates from the cyto cytoplasma to the nucleus. And when it binds to the nucleus, there is an upregulation of autophagy genes. So meaning you know, the cells are starting to eat their material within the cell 
but you know what we have been finding, for example, Maria Anna Maria Cuervo, that it, the, the cells are not eating randomly. They start to eat dysfunctional organelles, dysfunctional mitochondria, dysfunctional proteins. So it's like you know if you are doing a cleanup of the garbage that is in your cells, you are rejuvenating the material that is that you know that is composing the, the, the cells, the organelles, the proteins. At the same time, an upregulation of FOXO is causing increase in DNA repair genes like the DBDB1, an upregulation of antioxidant genes like SO2, and there is a major 13 fold upregulation of cyclin D that is an important uh, regulator of cell cycle of cell proliferation. Less cell proliferation, less divisions, less random mutation less cancer, less cells and essence. So these were transcripts, mRNA. You know, with David Sabatini and Adli Lamy, we also measure the phosphorylation of AKT, and we say there is a 50, 30 to 50% reduction in phosphorylation of AKT in the scheduled mass of people doing color restriction. Then we also measured HIT3 protein 70, HIT, HIT Shock protein 70 are chaperones that are very important for recognizing misfolded proteins and to try to refold them or to, uh, if they are not able to refold them in the correct way, to send it to the lysosome to be digested. So it's, it's an important proteostasis mechanism to keep the, uh, our proteins within the cells uh, young and functional. And here we see an eightfold increase in uh, the, the transcript transcript for Hixi protein 70, Hixi factor one and two. And with Gokano Tamajili, we also measured the, the, the protein concentration by Western blood, and we see that there is a major reduction in Hixi protein 70 in protein, LC3 and Beckley one. So the autophagy proteins as well. So as you can see here, you know, we are starting to understand some of the molecular adaptation of color restriction in humans, and we understand why color restriction has such a dramatic effect in, uh, in many disease and many conditions, and why these people, even if they are in the late 70s, they don't take any disease, they, have, they don't take any medication, they have no disease whatsoever, unlike many people of their age, the majority of people of their age. Uh, with uh, Marco De Maria in the colon mucosa, we are also be able to measure biomarkers of cell senescence, and we see you know, that you know color restriction in the colon mucosa, both in mice and in humans, uh, is causing a significant reduction in p16, p21, interleukin 6, and other biomarkers of cell senescence. So these data are suggesting that in humans as in mice on color restriction, there is less cell senescence. That means less production of uh, cell senescence associated secretory phenotype, meaning less inflammation, less factors are promoting cancer. Okay, there are many other data. I don't have time to go into the details. So, but you know, let me now make a point, you know, one of the problem is that like for everything, for exercise, for any intervention, we have to have the right balance. If you're over-exercising, we know it's detrimental for health. It causes problems to the heart and joints. So you, have, you don't have to over-exercise. And the same is for color restriction. Some, some of these people, you know, they, they were asking me, if I, am I overdoing color restriction? I don't know. The problem is that you know we don't have biomarkers to measure if they are doing the right amount of calorie restriction, if they are not going into a starvation mode. Because we know that you know if people are overdoing calorie restriction, apart to be extremely lean, they have cold sensitivity because of the lower T3. They have reduced libido because of the lower testosterone. There is reduced bone mass, even, even, even if bone quality measured by micro MRI of, MRI of the wrist is normal. And they have reduced fertility and, and menstrual irregularities. So 
one of the dogma when I started to work on color restriction was that the more color restriction, the better. We now know that it's not true. So James Nielsen basically did this, did this study in 2010, basically where he took different type of different strains of mice, many, many strains of mice, and he put them on 40% CR. And the results are that a third live longer, approximately a third do not live longer, and a third live shorter on 40% CR. Then Rafa de Cabo in this paper in cell metabolism, he took a couple of strains and on 40% CR, they don't live longer or even they live shorter. And he put them on 20% CR and now they live much longer. Meaning that for those type of strains, 40% CR was too much. It was like probably 70% for the classical strains I've been studying for years. And 20% CR is optimal. So again, we badly need, we urgently need some biomarkers that are telling us which is the right amount of calories associated with the optimal longevity. By the way, Rafa told me that, you know, even in these animals on 40% CR that they don't live longer or they live slightly shorter, when they were doing the autopsy, they were completely healthy. No disease, no pathological, gross pathological lesions. So the health span was increased, but probably the starvation was excessive. And so there was not enough energy to promote longevity. Now, another dogma that uh, was um, in place when I started to work in this field uh, 20 years ago, it was that, you know, the macronutrient composition of the diet was unimportant. What was important was only the reduction in caloric intake. Now we know that it's not true. We have multiple uh, evidence that you know that's not true. That you know the macronutrient and the, the composition of the diet, together with other things, is important. This is a review article that I wrote with Linda Partridge, published in Cell 2015, that is summarizing how different nutritional interventions are acting on different pathways. Um, I don't have time to go into the details, but you know, uh, very briefly, just to give you a, a sense of what we are discovering. So what one of the important discoveries of the last few years is that what is important is not only the caloric intake, the caloric reduction, but also the timing of when we eat this food. For example, uh, so this is important. So a few years ago, uh, before this paper was published, the data were already there, but you know, I, I came to Sydney as a visiting professor and the investigator, Steve Simpson, he showed me the data and basically what they did is in this experiment is that Instead of doing the classical color restriction, that is basically you weigh the food of animals for a couple of weeks. So let's say, you know, one, one mice is eating five grams of food. From that point on, you give the mice 3.5 grams. So that's 30% color restriction, okay? In this experiment, Steve Simpson and his collaborators, what they did, they created a pellet that was very, that was extremely rich in undigestible fiber, so he had a very low energy density. And so the animals they were living, they were eating all day long, so that you know they could get enough energy out of, of out of this low energy food. But even so, they ended up with a 30% calorie restriction. The results of the study were that they did not live longer. So when they told me the results, I said, "Wow." You know, immediately I said, you know, maybe it's because this very high fiber diet, you know, had issues with their gut health, you know, inflammation, you know, this, lots of undigestible fiber. But even so, even we don't know about that, you know, with, 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 with 100 percent, even if, you know, it looks like not. But, you know, we, we are not 100 percent sure, you know, this high fiber that may have, you know, some some health issues. But when they told me about it, I said, you know, look, wait a minute. 
when we do calorie restriction in animals, we don't feed them, you know, every six hours. We, we don't do breakfast, lunch, and dinner because mice are eating during the night. And therefore, you know, the postdocs, they are not going in, in the animal facility and they give one third of their calorie restricted uh, aliquot at 10 p.m., 1 a.m., and 6 p.m. They feed them once a day. The animals are super hungry and they eat everything in one slash two hours. And then they fast for 22, 23 hours. So what we've been studying for years has been alternate day fasting or an extreme time restricted feeding. And we knew that, you know, alternate day fasting is increasing lifespan in mice and rats and is preventing multiple chronic disease. The mechanisms are complicated. There are two beautiful reviews that you know you can read if you're interested. I don't have time. Let me go ahead and uh, show you some preliminary data. Well, we have the data, but I haven't published yet, so I cannot tell you the, the full data set. But you know what we have been doing in this randomized clinical trial in humans with the age between 30 and 65, BMI between 24 and 35, is to randomize people to two or three days of fasting per week, non-consecutive days, two days if the BMI was between 24 and 28, three days if it was between 28 and 35. It was not a water-only fasting. I designed this protocol where people uh, randomized to this intervention could eat as many non-starchy raw or and or cooked vegetable as they wanted at libitum that were dressed with only two tablespoons of olive oil because one tablespoon is 120 calories two tablespoons is 240 calories because vegetables non-starchy vegetables they have very low energy density you know they they can eat as much as they want and so we calculated that you know on average, they were eating 500 calories. So it was on a weekly base at 20, 23% calorie reduction if they were not overcompensating in the non-fasting days. So this is a beautiful approach because in this case, unlike the five to diet, people that don't have to wait their, uh, to weigh their, 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 their food. You know, they just, in these fasting days, they just eat, eat vegetable ad libitum with tab two tablespoons of olive oil. So the results are over the six months plus six months of uh, crossover is that basically these people that lost lots of weight. On average, 7% body weight, but there were people that lost even 30 kilos in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in six months. I, I'm not going to show you the data, uh, metabolic data, because it has not been published yet. Short, shortly, I'm going to present the data. Now, another topic that I would like to, to, to talk about very quickly is the role of protein and amino acid in mediating some of the, the beneficial effects of dietary restriction. Again, Steve Simpson published a paper in 2014 big study, lots of mice, and what it shows that, you know, the lower the protein intake within physiological limits, because proteins are important, the longer the, 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 the animals were living. So protein restriction independently of caloric intake was extending lifespan. We knew from previous studies by independent investigators that methyl restriction, if you restrict one essential amino acids, is extending lifespan and health span. These are studies, for example, you know, that we, we did in collaboration with, with, uh, with Roberto Pili on an animal model of uh, prostate cancer. These are xenografts. Luca P23-1 uh, uh, animal model of prostate cancer. What we see is that, you know, if you reduce protein intake from the typical 21% of the chow diet to 7%, there is a complete prevention 
So basically, the, the, the growth of this tumor it's blocked. And uh, the same, you know, we did the same experiments on a 7% protein diet on uh, uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and on a on a triple negative breast cancer, and we see the same reduction in, uh, in tumor growth. The mechanism is in part mediated by uh, down regulation of the mTORCH pathway that is uh, additive. Uh, there is something else because, you know, basically when we give, uh, uh, there is an additive effect with uh, rapamycin. And then there are also some epigenetic changes and uh, and then uh, in this experiment, what we did also, we didn't ch change caloric intake. The, the, that were isocaloric. They were isoprotex, so the same concentration of protein, 21%. But when we reduced, when we switched from uh, animal to vegetable proteins, we had a 50% reduction in uh, in cancer growth, suggesting you know, that it's not only important the quantity, but the quality, the amino acid content of the diet. And uh, to follow the story, this is another animal model. These were, these were uh, skid mice. Uh, these are black six mice. They are immunocomponent mice. This is a, a study we published in collaboration with Dudley Laming on cell reports. Dudley did some beautiful data in animals in this black six where you know he, he you know he used my diet you know seven percent protein diet versus 21 percent there was a significant reduction in blood glucose glucose tolerance improved and insulin sensitivity improved the animal they lost body weight body fat even if they were on uh, you know on an isocaloric diet but most important, again, to show the importance of specific amino acids, of the quality of protein. In this study, basically, uh, then Dudley, he kept the calorie the same, the protein the same, but he just reduced the brain chain amino acids in green. And as you can see here, he had the same improvement in glucose tolerance. Suggesting that you know the, the branch and amino acids are uh, mechanistically uh, responsible for an impairment in glucose tolerance in black six mice. But for example, the low the low protein was increasing FGF21, but the low branch and amino acids was not increasing FGF21, and that's what we are doing. You know we. My, my, my science is actually that, you know, to understand what is doing what, you know, because you have the same improvement in glucose tolerance, but the FGF21 is an important uh, hormone that is promoting longevity is, is increased only by total protein restriction and not by specific reduction in branch and amino acids. Then in the same paper, we published data on a, a randomized clinical trial uh, that I've conducted at Washington University, where we took people with a, a diagnosis of uh, prostate cancer that were scheduled to undergoing radical prostatectomy. And before surgery, we randomized them for four to six weeks to a seven, per, seven to nine percent protein intake, around 64 grams of protein per day, versus the control that was 95 grams a day. The diet was isocaloric. And uh, we fed people breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, you know, we gave them the, the, the food. And what we see is that basically there is a, a reduction in body weight, like in mice. There is a reduction in body fat, like in mice. There is a redu significant reduction in blood glucose, no change in insulin, and there is a major increase in FGF. And FGF31 is an important factor promoting longevity in, in, in transgenic animal eyes overexpressing FGF31. Now, uh, let me uh, conclude this topic about protein because I think it's very important. So the data you know, I'll show you so far is that you know, we need to eat the right amount of protein. 
and the right amount of protein probably is around 10% protein, 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And by the way, 0.8, that is around 10%, if what is recommended, if we look at the studies on the nitrogen balance studies, people who are eating 97.5% of the population eating 10% calcium from protein, they have they are in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a neutral or positive nitrogen balance. So they have enough proteins. And yet, in, especially in, in many uh, uh, Western countries, people are eating at least 14, 15%. And now with this uh, craziness of the high protein, low carb diet, people they are eating even more proteins. That's, that's bad. And, uh, uh, they, you know, so far I show you data in animals and some in humans, but you know, this paper is not mine, it's by Bettina Mittendorfer. She's a fantastic scientist working on uh, uh, insulin sensitivity. Uh, and in this study that she published in Cell Reports, uh, what she did, you know, she, she enrolled obese women and she randomized them half to 10% weight loss with a high protein diet, 1.3 grams um, per kilogram body weight, and half on a, on a uh, normal protein diet. She calls it a uh, low protein diet, but in reality, 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight is what is recommended by the international guidelines. Anyway, both they lost the same body weight by design, same reduction in visceral fat measured with the magnetic resonance, same reduction in liver fat with the MRI, but the women that lost 10% body weight on the 0.8 grams on the normal protein, 10% proteins, calories from protein, they had a nice improvement in insulin sensitivity measured with a clamp, and Bettina is an expert to, to do clamps, so it's a very good data. In contrast, the women that lost the same body weight, same visceral fat, same liver fat, had zero, zero improvement in insulin sensitivity. What does it mean? First of all, that a calorie is not a calorie. From a body composition point of view, yes. From a metabolic point of view, not. The other important result is that these women, they lost weight, they lost visceral fat, but they are, they, are, they are still insulin resistant and they have hyperinsulinemia. And you remember hyperinsulinemia is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is, is, stimulating the insulin of one pathway and is promoting aging and cancer. So my message is, please stay away from these low carb diets. High protein, ketogenic, doesn't matter because even the ketogenic is true. The proportion of fat is higher, but if you look the menu, what the people are eating, on this ketogenic diet is breakfast, lunch, and dinner, animal products, lots of proteins, okay? And what we know is that this high protein diet, for example, apart from FGF21 and uh, is basically blocking, even during weight loss, the improvement in insulin sensitivity and there are overactivating the insulin IGF-1 pathway that is driving cancer and aging. So please don't believe these paleo diet people, these uh, ketogenic uh, Atkins, South Beach, Duncan, uh, all this stuff, it's bad. Okay, and now we have the me metabolic molecular mechanisms, not only mice, these are human beings, randomized clinical trial, these not just association, okay? The last topic that I would like to touch with you very quickly is the role of diet in modulating the gut microbiota. So we have trillions 
approximately 100 trillions of bugs live in our gut and they are interacting with our body in several ways. We know that, you know, if we change diet, you know, some, not all of them, but some of the bacteria are changing rapidly. And not only the, the, the composition of the bacteria is changing, but also the function of the bacteria is changing, is the nature paper. With Jeffrey Gordon, uh, my collaborator, you know, we published a paper in Science in 2011 showing that in animals and humans, among all the nutrients, the, most, the two most important are protein intake and fiber. These two nutrients are important regulators of the type and function of bacteria. I've recently listened to a talk, you know, that, you know in, in a huge database of people that were, they collected the gut microbiota and among all the factors that are changing the composition of the gut microbiota is the biodiversity of vegetables. The more diversity of vegetables that people are eating, the more biodiverse and healthy gut microbiota. Just to give a couple of examples of how important and why is important the gut microbiota. So, if you're eating a diet that is very rich in meat, eggs, and uh, cheese, that is rich in L-carnitine and choline, these two nutrients, they get digested by the gut, gut microbiota, and the gut microbiota is producing a metabolite called TMAO that is absorbed in the circulation, and in animals is increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease, but also in humans. This is a New England Journal of Medicine paper showing that you know, the higher the uh, plasma concentration of this TMAO, the higher the risk of developing, of dying of myocardial infarction and stroke. The mechanisms are multiple. I don't have time to go into the details. Another, there are many, but another example of how important is the regulation of the diet regulation of gut microbiota is that a diet that is rich in fiber, in vegetable fiber, this fiber gets digested by the gut microbiota to produce metabolites called short chain fatty acids, like butyrate propionate, that they have specific receptors, they bind to specific G couple receptors that have multiple anti-inflammatory and immune modulator effects. So what we see in a high fiber diet through the gut microbiota is reducing inflammation and is increasing subsets of cells like the, um, the T7 T regulatory cells that are important for the prevention of autoimmune and allergic disease like asthma, um, inflammatory bowel disease. So what is what we are discovering that the steady increase in allergic disease and autoimmune disease that we are seeing in Western countries is probably at least partially mediated by um, the huge reduction in, 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 in the consumption of fiber rich foods like legumes, whole grains with refined grains, not whole grains and vegetables. All this process, low fiber, you know, the fiber content in the American diet is around 15 grams, in the Mediterranean diet is around 40, 45 grams per fiber per day. I'm almost finished. So these are another couple of important concepts. You know, what we are discovering is that what we eat is changing the gut microbiota, our gut microbiota, and our gut microbiota is influencing the response to vitamins or phytochemicals. For example, in this study, you know, uh, Jeffrey Gordon published in Cell, I'm a collaborator in this paper, Turmeric, that is the one of the compounds that is in, 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 in containing in, in, the, in the curcuma and the curry, uh, at the same concentration of, of turmeric, depending on the type of bacteria. So basically, Jeffrey took 
germ-free mice and he put feces from people eating different diets and what we see you know that the physiological response the transit time the peristalsis was different you see three hours versus five hours for the transit time based on the type of bacteria that we transpected in the germ-free mice suggesting that you know the effect of the vitamins and phytochemicals we are eat we are eating varies depending on the bacteria we have that depends on what we ate before so if we were on a vegetarian or a carnivore diet the effects as you can see here is changing drastically for example you know the people on the on the on the So it's changing drastically, okay? Now, what we have found, and this is another paper we published in collaboration with Jeffrey Gordon, is that the effects of color restriction, the metabolic, not the body composition, but the metabolic effects of color restriction depends on the type of bacteria that we have transfected in the germ-free mice. So even if you do 30% CR, but your, the, what, you, what you ate before was a different type of diet pattern, the metabolic effects are different. So just to tell you how interesting and complicated it is, you know, this dietary modulation, and we have to be more precise, more mechanistic, mechanistic in how we approach diet and the effects of diet in, 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 in humans. So conclusions. I hope you know I gave you an overview of all the beautiful science that is developing around the how different nutritional interventions they are impacting different different metabolic and molecular pathways in animals and in humans. We need more studies to understand what is the optimal intake of calories, protein, amino acids, exercise, so that you know we have the optimal inhibition or activation of uh, pro-aging or pro-longevity pathways. We also need more studies to understand how this diet is a different dietary intervention that are interacting with genetics. Because of course, you know, if I have a low cholesterol, or a, uh, probably the, the type of dietary intervention is different than, than if I have a high insulin. So you know, we can modulate our interventions based on our genetic background and also about, uh, about uh, based on on our epigenetic age, sex, physical activity. But you know. It's not only nutrition, as I'm going to try to explain in the next lectures. What is also important is how nutrition interacts with exercise. Exercise has some common metabolic adaptation, but some different metabolic adaptations, as I'm going to explain to you. So exercise, for example, is, has a powerful effect in increasing mitochondrial biogenesis, GLUT4, and other, other factors. Cognitive training is important for dementia prevention with diet and exercise, phytochemicals, probiotics, uh, sleep. It looks to be very important. I'm going to tell you about sleep. It looks like, you know, if you don't sleep enough, especially in deep sleep, in uh, delta wave sleep, you know, you are, your, your neurons are firing and depositing beta amyloid. Mindfulness, meditation, uh, the frequency of... Uh, Breathing and respiration is important, and then of course smoking pollution and medications. So, uh, yeah, this is the last slide I think is important. So, in this slide, what I'm telling you is that basically one of the problems with medicine nowadays is not only that you know that we wait to treat disease when there are clinical evidence instead of blocking the early signs you know when you know we don't still have disease we have already we have, we have only the metabolic alteration that you know over 20 40 years there are 
they are responsible for the development of these chronic diseases. But another important concept is that the great majority of disease that we see in our hospitals, in our clinics, have a common metabolic substrate. As doctors, we are taught to think in silos. You know, if you are a cardiologist, you treat cardiovascular disease. Uh, typically, you know, you are a super special in heart failure or uh, ventricular arrhythmias or coronary uh, artery disease. If you are an oncologist, you know, you know, you, you know everything about, you know, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, you know, now they are super specialized, each one in his own type of cancer. If you are a neurologist, you are an expert of uh, stroke, and so you are the director of the stroke unit or the dementia or the multiple sclerosis. And so, and because again, you know, we are working at the end, it makes sense, you know, if you have someone with stroke, you know, you have to deal with someone with stroke. But, you know, the problem is that, you know, before you reach stroke, you know, the common metabolic substrate is bleeding, is responsible for all these metabolic alteration, insulin resistance, inflammation, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, oxidative stress, and many other hormone adaptation like hyperinsulinemia, we're going to talk about it, changing other uh, transporters that are changing the biodisponibility of IGF-1 and testosterone estrogen that are driving at the same time cancer, fatty liver disease, dementia, stroke, coronary heart disease, and uh, nephropathy. So 80, approximately 80%, 60 to 80% of the typical disease that you know, we see in each medical specialty have a common metabolic substrate. And this common metabolic substrate can be changed by these four intervention. So basically, if we reduce mental stress strategies, uh, if we exercise and different type of exercise are uh, doing different stuff, you know, there is aerobic, sedentary and other ones. And then caloric intake, protein intake and the quality of diet, they are instrumental in changing many of these metabolic factors that are part of this common metabolic substrate. So what I'm telling you is that, you know, we now uh, have the knowledge, so, you know, you know, we can in a precise way, of course, you know, we are refining this knowledge, you know, but we already have enough knowledge so that, you know, between 60 and 80% of the disease that we see in our hospital could be completely preventable. And we, we could save a huge amount of money that could be used, you know, for other things, you know, for uh, the development of our countries, you know, the green economy, you know, more cultural activities. And so we waste a huge amount of money to treat terminal disease, the disease that are already developed, that have a 20 to 40 years history when it's too late. And I think this has to change. Bloomberg, for example, claims that you know the future of medicine is going to be prevention to pay this this model that is uh, disease center is unsustainable and the future is going to be prevention to pay with a mechanism based approach and um, let me thank some of my collaborators at Washington University and and, uh, and the MIT NIA Roswell Park Cancer Institute Harvard, Wisconsin University, and now at the Charles Perkin Center and at the University of Sydney. I hope this lecture, that you know, it's summarizing some of the data, you know, that we have produced in collaboration with other people and other data has given you a better idea of how beautiful and powerful is nutrition in modulating our risk of developing chronic disease and of living a long and healthy life. What we want is not to get people living to 80 and spending the last 20, 30 years in hospitals, but we want to get people who are 90, 100 with a physiological health of a 60 years old. And this is possible. We know that it is possible. We have just to do more research and for the time being to implement what we already know and we could drastically reduce many of the chronic disease we see in our hospitals. Thank you for your attention and uh, 
I'll see you soon.